My Lords, I beg to move Motion A that this House do not insist on its amendment 4J, to which the Commons have disagreed for their reasons 4K. My Lords, I would like to start this debate by paying tribute to the fire and rescue services across our country. In recent days, we have seen large fires in Greater Manchester and Shropshire that have been dealt with uh, by the fire and rescue services with exemplary bravery and professionalism. This is a reminder of why we want to get this bill through, to help fire and rescue services do their job, to ensure that buildings are properly and thoroughly assessed, and that the risk of fire is minimised as much as is possible. I am fully aware of the pain and anguish that the cost of remediation is having on leaseholders, but all of us in this House agree residents deserve to be and feel safe in their homes. I don't want to repeat all of the Government's reasons for resisting these amendments. However, I want to reiterate that this is a hugely complex area. There is no simple solution here, and I'm afraid it cannot be resolved through amendments to this short technical bill. The other place has now voted against uh, these different remediation amendments uh, put forward by your, uh, by your Lordship's House, the last one of which earlier today was by 64 votes. This confirms that the other place has supported the government's view that this bill is not the right uh, legislation to deal with remediation costs. There is a consensus in both houses that the fire safety order needs to be clarified. This is because we want to avoid a scenario where defects with the external walls or flat entrance doors in multi-occupied residential buildings are not identified resulting in a potential increase of fire safety risks for everyone living in such places. So given this consensus, coupled with the fact that the other place considers that the fire safety bill is not the right place to deal with remediation costs, I ask your Lordships again to agree that this bill should go on to the statute book. If noble Lords insist on a legal resolution to the issue of remediation costs through this fire safety bill, then I'm afraid that this important bill will fall on the ground that this could mean that responsible persons for multi-occupied residential buildings can argue that it is lawful to deliberately ignore the fire safety risks of the external walls and flat entrance doors. As noble lords have heard in previous debates, the government's ability to lay regulations to deliver on the entirety uh, of the Grenfell Tower Inquiry's recommendations is subject to this bill gaining royal assent. If this bill were to fall, then there will be a delay in delivering the inquiry's recommendations in respect of external wall structure and flat entrance doors. I want to place on record again that this government is committed to protecting leaseholders and tenants from the costs of remediation. Under the plans announced by the Housing Secretary in February this year, hundreds of thousands of leaseholders will be protected from the cost of replacing unsafe cladding on their homes. The £5.1 billion in grant funding made available to leaseholders is unprecedented. But I agree that leaseholders need stronger avenues for redress, and the Building Safety Bill will bring forward measures to do this, including making, directions as well as, uh, making directors as well as companies liable for prosecution. And I agree that the industry must play its part, and the Government agrees with the broad, uh, the broad polluter pays principle, and through our high-rise levy, and develop a tax, industry will pay. I will repeat my message from the last time that I stood here at the dispatch box. We rec recognise that the fire safety bill will mean more re remediation issues being identified. But there will be occasions where other measures to mitigate the risk are required rather than extensive remedial works. However, the solution and the costs involved will vary depending on the corrective measures required not all buildings will need extensive remedial works. For example, the vast majority of lower-rise buildings will not require the type of remedial work discussed in the House today. So to suggest this bill will unleash hundreds of thousands of costs, all of which will be major and substantive, is simply not the case. It is also incorrect to suggest that the bill will create further liability for leaseholders. The bill does not create liability. It is a simple bill clarifying the fire safety order to let our fire and rescue services do the job they do best, which is keeping us safe. My Lords, I ask you to reconsider your position insisting on the remediation cost amendments 
um, days before the end of this session, which risks the Government's ability to implement an important legal clarification that will improve fire safety and help protect lives. I beg to move. The question is that Motion A be agreed to. I now call Lord Kennedy of Southwark to move Motion A1. Uh, my Lord, um, firstly, I join with the noble Lord uh, paying tribute to the Fire and Rescue Services um, and the bravery, the bravery they've shown recently, but also bravery every day. But I would make the point that um, these heroes, they are heroes, are FBU members. And I think it's fair that they have not always been showing the respect they deserve from many people. I mean, particularly the Prime Minister, when he, when he was Mayor of London, didn't always show the FBU members the respect that they deserved. And these are the same people. To make that one point. For, firstly, I draw the attention of the House to my relevant registered interests as a Vice President of the Local Government Association, a non executive director of MHS Homes Limited, and the chair of the Heart and Medway Housing Association. It is most disappointing that we're back here again, and it is uh, very unusual uh, to, for us to push this again. But I am going to test the opinion of the House, and I accept that that is very unusual. Now, my amendment ensures that um, it's based on, obviously, on the amendment we had from the Right Reverend Pope, the Bishop of Normans, but it, it ensures that no costs are passed on to the leaseholders or tenants, and that subsection remains in force until the time we get the government statutory scheme. Further, it places a requirement on the government to come, the Secretary of State, to come back within 90 days to publish draft legislation to ensure leaseholders and tenants do not have to pay and also published a timetable for the implementation of that of legislation. And finally, within 120 days, the passing of this amendment, we also require a progress report from the Secretary of State. Now, why are we back here again, my Lords? Well, my Lords, we're back here because the Government have been quick to promise and slow to act. We're here because the Government are not listening, not listening to the innocent victims of the cladding scandal, people who should be at the very forefront of the levelling up agenda, if it is anything but a slogan which the government have no intention of delivering on. The people, the families whose homes are blighted, the people who need their government to come to their aid. But instead, the government made promises and they have spectacularly then failed to deliver on their promises. That's no way for a government to behave. I give notice, I said I intend to um, seek to the, divide the House when the time comes. We will do whatever it takes, is a statement the Government regularly put about, whether it's from the Chancellor announcing new measures or the Culture Secretary regarding the European Super League. Sadly, it's never the case, the Government, when it comes to dealing with the innocent victims of the cladding scandal. Perhaps in replying to the debate, the no rule of Greenhouse, the Minister for Fire Safety, can explain that failure to the House, because we've never heard from the Government what the plan is, and that is part of the problem. If we are informed of a clear, well thought out pathway, a route map to help the victims, then we could make progress. But for some reason, the Government just won't do that. Again, perhaps the Noble Lord Greenhouse can tell the House again on, on this pathway, this road map, when he responds to the debate. I want to see this bill go on the statute book. I don't accept for one minute, though, that this puts this bill at risk. We've still got to days before the end of the session. I don't want to hold the bill up. This is a good bill on what it does, which is to meant the first recommendation from the Grenfell Tower inquiry, the first bit of legislation since the fire, now, now nearly four years ago. No one could accuse the government of acting in haste. <laughs> on a separate matter, we still have six families in temporary accommodation following the fire Grenfell Tower. It is of vital importance that our dwellings are safe and people can sleep at night safely and, be, and, and not be in fear. The Government have committed £5 billion. I accept that's a significant amount of money. But the situation is far from satisfactory and it is the Government's gift to do something about it. It is only the Government that can do something about it, but at present they're just not willing to do so. As the Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of Norbans, told us when we last debated this issue, and I pay tribute to him for his leadership of seeking to find a solution to this scandal, the result can be bankruptcies, enormous mental health strains, and possibly worse. Part of the problem 
is that there have been no assurances to prevent the, re re prevent the remediation costs being passed on to leaseholders until the government's own scheme is operational. And this is, the, is what my amendment seeks to do today to prevent the cost being passed on to tenants and leaseholders, to prevent the cost of this scandal being passed on to the innocent victims. We have all seen in the media the heartbreaking reports of the crippling costs the leaseholders are having to bear, such as interim fire safety costs and high insurance premiums. Surely it should be the developers who, who built these flats that are defective, the insurance companies who provided the guarantees that no longer want to honour those guarantees, their commitments, and the professionals who signed the buildings off as safe should be paying through their professional indemnity insurance. But instead, it's the innocent victims who are left bearing the costs of this scandal despite the promises made to them. This leaves them all with a dilemma. Sell their lease, take on the debts resulting from negative equity, or stay in their leases and face huge debts in the form of, remedi re in the form of remediation bills, or possibly, in some cases, declare bankruptcy. Surely, my lords, that is wrong. The leaseholders, playing by the rules, paying their taxes, buying a home, doing the right thing, not being supported. They had no indication of this coming. This is a dreadful tragedy. In the absence of an adequate plan, the scheme to deal properly and fairly with these issues, there is no other way forward. I hope the House will, will support me today. These costs, we need to find a solution. I beg to move. The question is that Motion A1, as an amendment to Motion A, be agreed to. My Lords, if Motion A1 and A2 were both agreed to, A2 would replace A1. I now call Baroness Pinnock uh, to speak to Motion A2. My Lords, uh, I start by drawing the attention of the House to my interests, as recorded in the Register, as Vice President of the Local Government Association, and as a member of Kirkley's Council. My Lords, on three separate occasions, this House has confirmed its view that the government should address with urgency the plight of leaseholders and tenants who will be significantly and adversely affected by the consequences of the fire safety bill. The provisions made by the bill are not the issue. These are a welcome small step to address the failings exposed by the dreadful, dreadful tragedy. The government, and no doubt the noble lord, the minister, will state how important it is that this bill is passed. And we have heard the noble lord, the minister, say so a few moments ago. What both omit to say is that the government has been tardy in regard to the passage of the bill. The report stage of this bill in this House was in November 2019. If the government had made this bill a priority, we wouldn't be here in the final throes of this session seeking to find a just solution for those directly impacted by the bill. The amendment in my name reiterates the principle moved by the noble prelate, the Bishop of St Albans, at the last debate on this matter that this House has supported on three separate occasions, that the leaseholders and tenants must not pay for the exorbitant costs of remediation. We have listened to the government's criticisms of the previous amendments, and today's amendment, in my name, takes into account the reasonable expectation that leaseholders will be required to pay of minor fire safety works up to a value of £500 in any one year. What is so disturbing is that the government has consistently failed to propose just how leaseholders will be safeguarded from the costs of remediation. The building safety bill will come far too late to prevent untold harm on individuals and their families. Leaseholders have done everything right and nothing wrong and must not be expected to pay for those who have profited from construction failures. 
an overlord the minister will repeat no doubt that the government has a grant fund available for the removal of cladding from high-rise blocks but he fails to say it will not cover the costs of putting right the construction failures that are then exposed and doesn't include many, perhaps a majority of blocks affected. Individuals have shared with me the precise costs they are being asked to pay. For example, the total bill for remediation at Connect House in Manchester is 5.2 million pounds. The average bill per flat is 78,000 pounds to be paid in quarterly instalments by the end of this year. Hmm. Then there is M&M buildings in Paddington. ACM cladding has been removed following a government grant, but non-cladding defects, which the Building Safety Fund does not cover, is costing each leaseholder £40,000. And imagine living in a modern flat and discover that as a leaseholder, you are faced with a bill for £20,000 to put right internal steelwork and wooden balconies that the developers had failed to make fire resistant, even though that was part of building regulations at the time. These are just three leaseholders of thousands who are facing potential bankruptcy as a direct consequence of this bill. No one could possibly have budgeted for additional costs on that scale. But that is not the only extra bill suddenly landing on doormats. There are the demands for waking watch, insurance hikes and a fire alarm system. For Zoe in London, that has resulted in service charges rising from £194 a month to a totally unaffordable £700 every month. For some, those service charge hikes alone are forcing them into bankruptcy. The direct personal impact are not the only unconsidered consequences of this bill. The Sunday Times in last Sunday's edition reported that the Bank of England is concerned about, and I quote, the scandal's effect on property prices. The report states that up to 1.3 million flats are now unmortgageable and three million people face a wait of up to a decade to sell or get a new mortgage. The Leasehold Knowledge Partnership has found that 80% of auctioned fire risk flats failed to sell or were discounted by as much as two thirds. The social housing landlords, the total costs as they are unsupported by the government scheme, is estimated to be as much as £10 billion. And the knock-on effect of that is that there will be a dramatic reduction in the numbers of new builds for people who desperately need a home to rent. It is not, therefore, the bill itself that is the problem, but the consequences that are very grave indeed for individuals and their families as well as for the wider housing market. In the end, it comes down to a simple question of justice. Those who have done everything right and nothing wrong must not be asked to pay the price for those developers who, in some instances, knowingly failed and profited by that safety failure. I really cannot understand the government's obduracy in the face of a calamity that is about to fall on leaseholders. I find it hard to imagine taking a decision that knowingly forces thousands into potential bankruptcy and homelessness. I urge the government, even at this late stage, to listen, listen, to those who on, are on the brink of losing their home 
and everything they have worked and saved for. They have done everything right and nothing wrong. And I give notice that if the noble Lord Kennedy seeks to divide the House, he has the support of these benches. If, however, he chooses not to do so, then I will seek the opinion of the House. My laws to confirm that we are debating motion A1 at the moment and that Bar Baroness Pinnock has spoken to but not yet moved motion A2. And I now call the Lord Bishop of St Albans. Well, my lords, here we are again. And uh, I don't want to detain your Lordship's house too long because uh, I think everything's been said several times already. But I do just want to make a few comments, if I may. I too want this bill to pass. I do pay tribute to the uh, money that Her Majesty's Government has already found and put on the table, which is very significant. But since we were last gathered here, uh, the sheer scale of the crisis, which is slowly, the very early stages, beginning to unfold before us, is becoming ever more clearer. That's why I believe the majority in the other place is declining each time an amendment goes back, because those uh, long-serving, seasoned campaigners in the other place um, realise what's going on. The stories are coming out absolutely relentlessly, and new research is being published. If I could just briefly comment, just at uh, two minutes to four this afternoon, I received um, an email from someone who works um, in Parliament. I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to call her Claire. That's not her real name, but she'll know who she is because she, she emailed me at 3.56 and she asks me, will I speak up? Will you speak up for the leaseholders again and table an amendment? Uh, I bought a flat under the shared ownership scheme. I own a 25% share, yet I'm liable for 100% of the costs. I'm already paying an additional amount each month and I know this will amount, this amount will soon increase as further remediation works takes place. I simply cannot afford to pay for the remediation works, nor should I have to. The stress of this situation is becoming intolerable. My mental and physical health are approaching a state of collapse. Will you speak up? Was what she said. Now, I've not met her yet. I hope she's going to come and say hello to me one day when she perhaps guesses who I am or sees me around the place. But this is someone, my lord, who we are bumping into, who's, who works in this place, who serves us. And of course, it's not just the many uh, individuals since we last came. The research by the Prudential Regulation Authority, um, which is assessing the building the uh, uh, scandal which proposes, they, as they put it, a systemic risk to the UK financial sector. And I, I just quote that some of the um, work that's been done since then is finding the huge number of flats and homes which are simply unsellable or in some cases uh, for example, a one-bedroom flat at Left Bank in Manchester failed to sell despite being listed for half the £330,000 its owner had paid back in 2017. And, of course, what members in the other place are realising is that, is that slowly this is going to, 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 to roll out. This is going to mean that many people who... Uh, this bill relies on are going to be able somehow to stump up this money to repair the buildings are not going to have the money it's not they're not going to be they're not going to be repaired uh, because some of these people are going to have to walk away either willing well probably very unwillingly um, so not only have we got the individual stories coming out we also have some really worrying uh, assessment on the housing and financial market of our country where affecting some three million people, as we've heard from the noble Baroness Pinnock, uh, are being affected. And, of course, these people, as we're paying tribute to fire rescue officers, uh, I have three emails from fire rescue officers who were affected by this cladding themselves personally, along with nurses and police and teachers and care workers and, well, you, you know the sort of people we're, we're talking about, and many others. Now, I do believe 
that the intent of both these amendments is the same, which is accepting that we have a very difficult problem, that we do, of course, really want to see um, some sort of uh, brokered agreement where uh, both developers, cladding manufacturers, freeholders, as well as leaseholders make their fair contribution. We realise everybody's going to have to, to do that. But we do feel that actually there need to be protections for leaseholders and tenants over these coming months before the government scheme comes in. I am minded to support this amendment if the noble uh, Lord Kennedy brings this to a division, but I still continue to hope and plead that Her Majesty's Government will be able either to come up with some compromise themselves or make some sort of formal undertaking about the uh, Building Safety Bill and what it's going to offer so that we can all get behind this and get this really important bill through. I call the Earl of Lytton. My Lords, um, I start by declaring my professional involvement with uh, uh, construction and property matters and also as a Vice President of the LGA. Now, I think we should be in no doubt that the government has triggered an issue that is destined to cause significant damage, loss and distress to many leaseholders and tenants. My comments will uh, be aimed uh, at both the uh, amendments A1 and A2 in the names respectively of the Noble Lord Lord Kennedy and the Noble Baroness Lady Pinnock, and I uh, commend them for their persistence and their, their, their diligence. I also commend the government for committing its £5.1 billion to this matter, but the reality is that money alone is not the answer. It requires a plan. It requires a plan that's coordinated, structured and comprehensive. And to be honest, it was needed the day before yesterday and certainly not at some unspecified time in the future. The government cannot in all conscience have been unaware but that a situation where a significant sector of property might be affected by the expansion of the fire safety regime would very likely arise nor deaf to the observations of just about every informed observer from, I believe, the Bank of England downwards, warning of the need for action. And the ill effects triggered by this bill are already plain and evident in terms of insolvencies, repossessions, and bills for safety works of such improbably mind-numbing sums as to make every speaker in the time-limited debate in the other place this afternoon, every one, that is, save the minister, voice support for the amendment we passed last time round. And these problems are only just unfolding as the Right Reverend Prelate has identified. And the horror story is therefore far from over. And I don't accept the government's claim that it is a small number of properties that are affected. And I don't believe the government has demonstrated that there is any statistical backing to that claim. The government's own partial scheme under the yet to be introduced building safety bill will neither offer relief to anything more than a modest proportion of those affected, nor will it arrive in time to assist many of those in its intended target group as matters stand at the present. Now, I don't blame the minister. I believe he's a person of great integrity, uh, but I do blame the government machine he appears to be obliged to defend. But I have to say, the stance of the government here is neither the coherent nor considered response of any responsible government, given the scale of the issues at stake and the market and financial perils that are the probable and natural outcome of the changes created by the bill. The government appears to me to have, been res to have resorted to arm twisting, pitting the need to respond to the circumstances of and death toll in the Grenfell fire against the financial and psychological terror to be inflicted on maybe a million more households. It accuses us of holding up the bill, perhaps causing it to fall. It conflates the regular maintenance obligation of, say, changing a backup battery in an alarm system with the fresh requirement to complete new, a whole new safety installation. It suggests that the matter uh, 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 is um, is is uh, involved 
um, it, it has uh, th is less than than those who have commented to me have made clear. And I do rather take exception to such tactics. The government could induce its own scheme, could have done so long ago. It could commit to doing so now. It could uh, tell us that it will use the Queen's speech uh, at the uh, forthcoming state opening of Parliament to announce a forfeiture protection measure in appropriate circumstances. It could take up the suggestion in the Fox Amendment in the other place that a regime akin to, akin to the Contaminated Land Act and that the polluter pays principle should be introduced. It could follow up the McPartland Amendment route to redress, uh, the one I tried to persuade the government of last time we were debating this. And so I asked the minister this, is the government willing to take up any of these initiatives as opposed to indicating that it accepts the principle? Or will it continue to stall with arguments that all amendments and suggestions are unworkable, have unforeseen consequences, or are otherwise impractical? Huh, I should say rather like the effects of the bill that have got us into this pretty pass in the first place. I agree the issues are complex, which is exactly why government level intervention and leadership are required in order to corral those responsible. That is a government duty. A few days ago, I circulated to the minister and other noble lords the uh, professional indemnity insurance consequences that are unfolding. This is just another issue that is befalling the sector. I cannot conceal a sense of outrage here about inaction and indeed worse than inaction over what for significant numbers of people will be an absolute catastrophe an inaction over something not about money so much as the need for good governance and necessary executive process. And so painfully absent is any sense of mission purpose or acceptance of the role of government in dealing with hard cases that I find myself having run beyond empty my natural inclination to give the benefit of the doubt to the government of the day, much though it is my normal inclination to do so. I have tried to bring my technical knowledge to bear without success. There is not the slightest doubt in my mind that the minister understands and through him the government understands, yet it chooses not to act to avert terrible outcomes for innocent homeowners. So I have to say with much regret that if the only way to persuade the government to take the responsibilities seriously, to oblige it to take the sort of action any government ought and which only government really can take, then I am left with no choice that satisfies my conscience and the directions of my moral compass, other than to support the amendments A1 in the name of the noble Lord, Lord Kennedy, preferably with the amendment A2 in the name of noble, noble Baroness Lady Pinnock. Thank you. The following members in the chamber have indicated they wish to speak. Baroness Fox of Buckley, Lord Stoneham of Droxford and Lord Adonis. So I now call Baroness Fox of Buckley. Uh, my Lords, uh, while the headlines are all focusing on the scandal of who paid for the internal refurbishment work on a flat in number 10, for me, this is a far greater scandal about who is being forced to pay for the external remediation works of over a million flats caught up in this fire safety cladding debacle. As things stand, it is innocent leaseholders, the only party uh, who has no hint of blame for negligence or mistakes, and yet they're the sole group to shoulder the burden. And we've heard some passionate speeches about that. Why are we back here, or why am I back here? I just need some reassurances from the government. They say this is not a legislative matter and this is not the legislation. So what are they going to do? Many of us united here who usually would disagree. I mean, my goodness, myself and the noble Lord Adonis on the same side, whatever is the matter. But we're here in good faith. This is not Tory bashing. This is not a go, a cheap dig at rich developers or landowners. It's a warning to the government for me because it reminds me of the convictions of the 39 postmasters, now cleared but after the tragedy of what befell them because no one would listen. And it also feels to me like a betrayal 
of all those promises made to the Red Wall voters that this government cares about the aspirations of ordinary people. It seems to me to make a mockery of parliamentary priorities, and I genuinely don't understand what is the point of us being here and debate, debating levelling up when many leaseholders concerned bought their flats or houses as part of affordable housing schemes, their frontline workers who've been thrown to the wolves. And similarly, what's the point of legislating on the welfare of ex-veterans and supporting the police when one ex-veteran and serving police officer writes to me explaining that he's worked every day since he was 16, has never needed to rely on state benefit or accrued debts in any way, and now he faces bankruptcy and could even lose his job as a bankrupt. He describes it as a living nightmare. He says, I am a leaseholder and that is the biggest mistake of my life. What a terrible thing to say. And he says that he's disillusioned, angry and frustrated and powerfully notes, quote, that he feels defeated that all his attempts to be heard are ignored. These leaseholders feel ignored and whatever happens here today, I ask the government to listen and not ignore them. At the very least, can I ask the Minister to listen, perhaps then, to the Bank of England? Because as the noble Lady Baroness Pinnock noted, last week the Bank of England said that it's seriously assessing whether the building safety scandal could cause a new financial crisis, hardly an encouraging sign for building back better or economic growth. So even from a pragmatic basis, I don't understand why the government won't note that if a mo over a million properties become unmortgageable, if we create a negative equity problem, if leaseholders become bankrupt and can't pay for remediation costs, if there's a knock-on effect on property values, if there's an effect on labour market mobility because people are unable to sell their homes and are trapped uh, and have to stay where they are, then surely this is a matter that the government, even the Treasury, might look at. We, might, we look to the government here uh, because only the government can provide the capital up front to pay for the works now. The Commons reasons for rejecting the amendment, it says, is the issue of remediation costs is too complex to be dealt with in the manner proposed. And I just want to know what manner do you propose then? The noble Earl Lytton's plan seems sensible to me. I'd like to hear it from the government. I do agree that there's no easy solutions. And that's why it is too easy for the government to boast of generous loan funds and grant schemes when people are illegible to apply for them and are facing huge bills now. And although it's tempting, uh, and I still think it would be too easy to blame developers or whatever, and that's not my intention. I just don't want the blameless to pay. It's also too easy to use the Grenfell tragedy to imply that those of us supporting the leaseholders or going behind these amendments are cavalier in any way about fire safety standards. And as a leaseholder, I assure you, I'm not cavalier about my own safety. But I do note that today, Grenfell United campaign have issued a statement saying using Grenfell recommendations to justify the government's indifference is deeply upsetting to us. And they say, as the victims of the Grenville fire, that they stand in solidarity with innocent leaseholders. So I know that this bill is full of good intentions, but it does create liabilities for leaseholders without giving them any means of address. And I just think it betrays, more broadly, any commitment to a meritocratic society. And I just appeal to the government to listen. I call Lord Stoneham of Droxford. Um, we've had some very good speeches, and I think some very good uh, points have been, been made, uh, so I will speak quite briefly. Um, first of all, may I declare my own interest in property, and uh, as uh, someone very experienced, 15 years' experience in housing association work, and I'm largely speaking tonight on behalf of uh, Lord Newby, who's been tied up in commission work most of the afternoon. Uh, looking back at the last week's debate uh, at the Minister's speech and also the Commons uh, this afternoon, I thought there was a, far too much emphasis um, on the fear of the bill not going through rather than trying to set out and address the concerns not only of both houses but of leaseholders who have the uncertainty, the fear of liability 
and simple fear uh, prevailing. And uh, that's what we need to address. And that's why uh, the government, I think, is in, in, in some difficulty getting the final decisions on this bill. Um, let us not forget that uh, a lot of the leaseholders affected uh, by these problems are first-time buyers. Uh, developers made a lot of money out of government deals. Uh, the government's been very, very keen on first-time buyer schemes and on stamp duty relief. Uh, why is it that they're just so reticent to spell out more detail and give more assurance uh, to leaseholders in these problems that they're facing. I think Lord Lytton was absolutely right. The government's very clean on, keen on plans in all sorts of areas, but they really do need a plan in this area to deal with this problem. I mean, just one area, pooled insurance. Um, the, 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 there is great fear of the costs for leaseholders just of their insurance going up because of the uh, of, the, uh, of the problems that they're facing and the extra risk of, of the insurance companies that they, they assess. It is, the government responded very quickly when there were pictures of people with their homes flooded out and uh, residents uh, trying to sort of uh, deal with their problems in specific geographical areas and came up very quickly with pooled insurance schemes. Why aren't they doing that more in, in this area? Uh, this is a very specific group and they need uh, help all the evidence and experiences that the problem will grow. Uh, we've got evidence in our own ranks of one of our peers who, whose uh, block had a cladding problem. When they, took the cladding prob uh, when they took the cladding down, it was found to be unsafe structurally, the block of flights. So this is a growing problem. I mean, what lies behind the, uh, the cladding, I suspect, is what's scaring the Treasury rigid. Uh, but there is a problem that's got to be dealt with. And uh, it's, uh, these, I'm afraid a lot of these properties were built, designed for first-time buyers. The developers knew they had to keep the price down when prices were escalating, but they also kept the cost down because they wanted to make their profit and they made a lot of money. So there will be all sorts of problems in these buildings. And as time goes on, I fear the, the, the leaseholders, you know, they, they see the situation last week of the, the post office submasters, and they just think they'll be left behind by the, the bureaucracy and the government machine failing to address their problems and being just left to hang out to dry. They need protection from eviction. They need to know exactly how they're going to be able to access grants. They need to see the government putting pressure on the developers. You know, I mean, in some respects, the government is a bit too close to some of those developers, but they need to be seen. The government needs to be seen to be taking on the developers and the companies and the contractors who are involved in these buildings and make sure it never happens again. The industry, in fact, is dysfunctional, and it's going to demand government intervention to address skills, regulation, and the whole quality of development in this country. The government needs a plan and a timescale. It needs to address the uncertainty and the fear amongst very vulnerable people. And it needs to start now as the problem will grow. And that's why we support these amendments. I now call Lord Adonis. Uh, my, my Lords, the cladding scandal is uh, turning into the next Hillsborough scandal in terms not only of the terrible and avoidable loss of life, but the failure of the public authorities to react in a timely, just and effective manner afterwards. And as event after event unfolds and failure after failure uh, succeeds each other in terms of, of government inaction, uh, I'm afraid the scandal grows. And it, there will come a point, those of us who have seen these events over many years will know, there will come a point where the government will have to concede on these issues. Anyone, my Lords, who watched the debate in the House of Commons this afternoon and saw the impassioned speeches by a string of Conservative MPs, Conservative MPs, many of whom were those who had encouraged in their political lives first-time buyers to buy their properties, including many of them to buy council properties as leaseholders, properties that are now unsaleable and, and submerged in negative equity without even a proper schedule of works that can be agreed, will know that this position is becoming not only unsustainable politically, but is becoming a moral quagmire on the part of the public authorities at large, local authorities, regulatory authorities, 
and the government itself. And uh, the minister is an in an unenviable position because we all know why he's in the position that he is, which is that to give the kind of commitment that's being talked about could mean that the five billion scheme, which the government has so far announced, could, on the basis of estimates I've seen and were being quoted in the House of Commons, be 10 or 15 billion. But my lords, what we have to work to in this situation is the just solution. And the just solution is clearly that innocent leaseholders shouldn't be held accountable for costs which had nothing to do with them beyond their control and purely the authority of shoddy developers or inadequate public authorities. And those developers should, of course, be held accountable in due course. And the role of the government is to see that in the interim, and that interim could be many years, it could be decades before these issues are resolved, that innocent leaseholders aren't held to ransom. And I mean genuinely, my lords, held to ransom because they cannot sell their house, their flats and their properties at the moment until the cladding is sorted out. And in many cases, they'll be completely unable to meet the costs. The most powerful speeches in the House of Commons this afternoon, my lords, were made by Ian Duncan Smith and uh, Liam Fox. And if the uh, noble baroness Lady, Lady Fox thinks that she and I aren't always on the same wavelength, I can assure the House that, that Ian Duncan Smith, Liam Fox and I hardly ever find ourselves in, in the same company. But everything that they said today was utterly compelling and they were reading from accounts given to them by their constituents of estimates for works of 30, 40, 50,000, negative equity, inadequate access to the fire safety fund, insurance increases of 1,000%, um, int uh, uh, large charges being faced by leaseholders for interim measures and charges not covered by the scheme, the forced loan scheme that the government said would be announced in the budget. One MP, I think it was the Conservative MP for Southampton, said, which budget is the Chancellor talking about because it hasn't come in this budget? Is it going to be the one in next year or the one in 2030? My Lords, these are the elected representatives of the people who are seeking to hold the government to account and our role as a revising chamber in a matter of such huge importance as this is to see that their voice can be properly expressed and heard. And when the Minister said that there was a decisive majority in the House of Commons, between today's vote in the House of Commons and the previous vote, the government's majority fell by half, half as a result of one further debate where these issues have been properly aired. So I think we do have a duty to send this issue back. And I'm absolutely sure if the government does succeed in railroading it through, and it probably has the votes to do so, I think it's right that we should, should see whether uh, there's, with a further opportunity for discussion, whether further progress can be made, it probably does, then I think it's only a matter of time before they have to make significant further concessions. But, and they, and I simply say this, uh, with all due respect to the Minister, uh, they will drag the reputation of the government and the states to a much lower level by not conceding in a timely fashion than by doing so as they should have done at some point over the last four years, because this has been going on, but certainly in this end game where these issues have been raised as matters of acute concern. Just to deal with the arguments, though, my Lords, when the Minister says that it's not correct or appropriate to use this bill to legislate on this issue, my noble friend Lord Kennedy's motion does not use this bill to legislate for a solution. What it does is to require the government in due course to come forward with its own legislation. All it does in its various sections is to set timescales down by which the government must come forward with legislation. If the government say it's not prepared to come forward with a legislation and last time, because the arguments keep moving, the noble lord, the minister, said that it might not require legislation, he might be able to take all of these actions to protect leaseholders without legislation, then I think it's incumbent on him then to give a commitment if he's not prepared to accept my noble friend's amendment because of the legislative components to say when the government will come forward with the scheme. And um, uh, Christopher Pincher, the Minister in the House of Commons, made a whole lot of spurious suggestions in his uh, reply uh, in, in the House of Commons just a few hours ago. He said that, uh, that the uh, proposal uh, by the Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of St Albans, was ineffective because it would prevent very minor costs. He said very minor costs from being passed on. Uh, like replacing smoke alarms. Uh, my Lords, that's a ludicrous suggestion that the government could come forward immediately with a scheme to deal with minor costs if it was so minded. And I see the noble baroness Lady Pinnock's amendment actually specifically exempts 
minor costs. And uh, it also, he also said that, um, uh, that it would absolve leaseholders of their responsibilities for works which might be their responsibility. My Lords, there may be cases, and there will be cases, where leaseholders have responsibilities, and they should be held accountable for them. But the much, much bigger issue we're dealing with here, which we as a parliament have a responsibility to deal with, is where the state has failed in its responsibilities, and developers have failed in their responsibilities too. So I think we're absolutely right to be sending this matter back to the House of Commons if there's a majority to do so. And I think, irrespective of whether or not the government resolve this matter over the next few days before the end of the session, they will be, like the Hillsborough disaster, like the, the Horizon disaster, they will, by the force of public opinion and the weight of natural justice, be forced to move on this issue. And I think it's simply deplorable, my lords, that it will be done at the very end of a long stage of pressure that will bring the reputation of the state for fair play to a very low ebb indeed. Minister, to reply to the debate, Lord Greenhound. My Lords, I want to bring by, begin by saying that we all, we all feel the, the plight of leaseholders, and I spend most of my time as Building Safety Minister uh, and Fire Minister in meetings at the building level trying to accelerate the pace of remediation. And despite the fact that we've had a global pandemic over the last year, uh, for the very same bladding that we had uh, outside Grenfell Tower, we've seen uh, over 150 starts on site and now 95% of buildings uh, have either had the cladding removed or are fully remediated or have workers on site and are with mo within months of making the building safe. These are hard yards. I've worked with colleagues at all levels of government, uh, with the GLA and the Deputy Mayor, uh, with the appropriate lead in London councils for the London, with Mayor Burnham in Greater Manchester. So there's a huge effort, and very often that involves very difficult conversations, very brutal conversations with building owners and developers to get a move on. And in over half the cases of the buildings that had aluminium composite material, we saw the building owners step up and uh, either fund the remediation or, or carry it ahead with the works, um, covering that with warranty schemes without passing the costs on to leaseholders. Uh, these are very difficult times uh, for leaseholders, but that's why, in answer to the noble Lord, uh, Lord Kennedy, uh, uh, the uh, Housing Secretary announced a very comprehensive five-point plan in February, uh, and essentially uh, we have increased the Building Safety Fund by some three and a half billion to 5.1 billion, and the details of how that um, building, revised Building Safety Fund um, will be spent will be announced in, uh, very shortly. In addition, we've announced a high-rise levy that will form uh, part of the building safety bill uh, and also a tax on developer because it's developers because it is important that the polluters pays and also uh, the, the fact that there needs to be a financing scheme um, uh, for buildings um, that are uh, medium rise so six stories or, um, between four and six stories the, that is the plan that we put on the table um, and I would also point out that uh, in answer to the uh, that noble, both the noble Earl, Earl Lytton and also noble, noble Baroness uh, Lady Fox of Buckley, uh, that the bill does not create liability. This is a simple bill clarifying the fire safety order to let our fire and rescue services do the job they do in keeping us safe. It is a bill that clarifies an existing regime. It does not create a new liability. I want to be absolutely clear about that. In addition, I agree with the noble Earl, Lit uh, noble Earl Lytton that we do need to strengthen redress. In order to stop this all falling on the, the taxpayer, we need to do that. And I have been very clear that we will bring forward measures uh, that will do that as part of the Building Safety Bill, that will make directors as well as companies liable for prosecution in some instances. The reality is it is absolutely ludicrous that the statute of limitations under the Defective Premises Act is only six years. That is absolutely ridiculous. That is the statutory period of redress. Now, we will, re we will bring forward measures to deal with that point. As I say, when I buy a, a pair of tweezers, I get a lifetime guarantee. When a poor leaseholder invests their life savings and makes the most significant payment in their lives to own their own home, the statutory redress levels is just simply not, uh, is simply not um, acceptable. Uh, that, that sort of period. Um, now, 
uh, I come back to the, uh, both amendments 4L and 4M, and I'm afraid that they, they, just, they are unworkable. They're impractical, and they don't deliver the solutions for leaseholders. Uh, as noble lords have now have heard um, before now, it, uh, it is impractical and confusing to amend the fire safety order to try to resolve the who pays issues. These amendments, in so doing so, uh, these amendments uh, will now will seek to cover the relationship, the very complicated relationship under landlord and tenant law, in, including financial obligations and liabilities between freeholder and leaseholders. And frankly, these matters do not sit naturally with the fire safety order. My Lords, um, as I've previously said, I, I, I don't, uh, the, neither the uh, Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop St Albans, I think spoke very eloquently in the, to his amendment um, and, to, and to these two amendments that are being proposed. Uh, ni none of these amendments work because essentially, once again, they orphan liability. Uh, and they orphan the liability of works until such time that a statutory scheme is in place that pays for the work directly attributable to the Act. In answer to the noble Lord, Lord Adonis, it, both, or both his amendments do reference the provisions of the Act in so doing. I have um, talked about the difficulties of defining which work, works might be directly attributable to the Fire Safety Bill provisions and which are not. I've gone, on to that, um, I've gone over that ground several times. Orphaning liability simply delays essential fire safety works. In addition, the proposed scope of the of works remains too broad, even with the noble baroness Lady Pinnock's £500 threshold. It simply doesn't resolve the issue. Some of the works that may be required will be very low cost, where anyone would reasonably expect the leaseholders to pay, and that frankly could be more than £500 a year. No taxpayer scheme for such minor works will be forthcoming, and then we, we reach deadlock. There's an additional issue that hasn't been raised by noble lords, which is subsidy, subsidy control issues. It's a, it's a small point, but it's important. But depending on specific details, it is possible that such a statutory scheme would not be permissible under subsidy control rules, because some leaseholders are undertakings, for instance, buy to let. And the subsidy control rules limit how much benefit can be conferred on undertakings. In effect, it may not be possible to relieve leaseholders and tenants from all costs for remedial work attributable to the bill without breaching subsidy control. Further detailed consideration is needed, as I know the noble Lord Kennedy knows. Um, my Lords, since these amendments are not sufficiently detailed and would require extensive drafting of primary legislation, it would continue to delay the implementation of the Fire Safety Bill and the important reforms it intends to carry out. These amendments would ultimately be self-defeating as the pace and progress of all fire safety works would be stalled, le still leaving leaseholders in an invidious position. I ask once again that noble lords exercise sound judgment. These amendments are well-intentioned. They are well-intentioned. However, the fire safety bill is not the silver bullet to resolve the issue of remediation costs being passed on to leaseholders. This is the wrong place for this kind of legislation, and in any case, the amendments are likely to be ineffective and possibly risky for some leaseholders and even the taxpayers. I must emphasize once again that it isn't the solution for leaseholders uh, or what the taxpayer deserves. My Lords, this House has a cho choice. On the one hand, we face more dither, more delay, and the very real risk, risk that the fire safety bill falls or you support this vital clarification of the fire safety order, support a bill that ensures the Grenfell Tower fire, fire tower recommendations are delivered and help home, make homes safer. Lord Kennedy. <clears throat> My Lords, I thank um, all noble lords that have spoken in this um, debate. I must say I'm, I'm disappointed in the response from the Noble Law Greenhouse to the debate. Um, though I did note um, not one speech from the government uh, benches, not one speech other than the Minister uh, from, from the, the uh, government benches uh, supporting the position of the government. I must say if I was over there 
I wouldn't get up and support the government either. You know, so, I mean, um, I, I don't understand why members of the government benches are, are sitting there very quietly, uh, not wishing to defend this. And I, I think they're probably very, being very sensible there, because frankly, the government position is indefensible, particularly when you look at the um, promises the government have made. That's part of the problem here. You know, uh, the government make promises and they think they can get away with them. Actually, they will, we'll make a promise, no one will think anything about it. We'll then mess around a bit, and well, I'm sorry, you know, people, this is, issue is not going to go away. And I fear there's a disappointing lack of understanding of the plight of our peer, innocent victims, innocent victims of the cladding scandal. People are really in trouble here. We've heard it tonight, we've heard it before. And they need their government to help them. They need their government to help them. The Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of St Albans, highlighted another case of, of, of Clare, who works somewhere in the Palace of Westminster who bought a 25% share in, a, in probably our first property and is now trapped. And that's, these are innocent victims here. I mean, why haven't we had a summit at number 10 to sort this out? I asked that last time. I never got an answer. We were going to have a summit about, about the football pro problems, but why haven't we had a summit? I mean, if the, the noble Prebble is right, I mean, we need a meeting at Cobra, actually, to talk about the, the financial crisis that's on its way on the back of this. But no, nothing from the government. And why isn't the government standing up for innocent victims? Why can't the government set out a route map, the pathway, set out this is how we're going to level up? You know, our level up agenda actually will help those first time buyers, those innocent victims, and this is what we're going to do. But no, we hear nothing. So I do want to ask the House to think again, uh, our third place to think again. There is no risk to the bill. This is the House of Lords doing its job asking the other place on the matter of the utmost importance to think again. And I think it's really, really important. And um, I would just say to the government, you know, if you'd spend a bit more time addressing the seriousness here, we, we could move it forward. I'm conscious that my, my, my Lord Adonis made the point that the government accepted these amendments originally weeks ago. They brought the trade bill back, but this bill just sat there and never came back. Then it turns up this week, oh, we've got to be careful now because we're going to run out of time. You sat there for weeks doing nothing with it. You could have brought it back here. And these men might not be the, the cleverest amendments. Now, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a parliamentary draft person, nor other people in here. But you know what we're trying to do, you know the intent we're trying to achieve here. You've got loads of really clever people working for the government here. You could sort this out if you wanted to. So I want to test the opinion in the House.